Trying to beat Persona 1 in Japanese without knowing the language was a train wreck of a challenge. So let's get back to something more fun. Welcome to RPG Challenge Runs and today we find out if we can beat Persona 4 Golden using only a single slime. You're really gonna try to beat the entire game with only a slime? Oh, this is going to end badly. The rules are simple, in battle we can only summon the slime persona, which can be obtained in the very first part of the game. We'll need other personas to boost social link events, but we won't be allowed to use any of those personas in or out of battle at all, not even for healing. This is a solo run, so we'll be ditching all of our teammates as soon as the game will allow. We're also playing on a fresh save file on the hardest difficulty, which is called very hard or risky depending on your region. We can't use glitches, packs or mods. My thoughts before starting the run are that we'll be able to beat a few dungeons, but the endgame content that's obviously designed for a full party will be genuinely terrifying. To get into the slimy spirit, we name ourselves Flub Burr. While we speed through the intro cutscenes, let's take a look at the persona that's hopefully going to carry us to victory. Slime is a weak level 2 persona with terrible stats, even worse moves, and a weakness to fire, which is a very common element in this game. Slime's whole gimmick revolves around trying to inflict fear upon enemies, a status ailment which can cause them to miss turns or even flee from battle, but it won't work against bosses. Slime's only saving grace is a slight resistance to physical damage, which might be helpful in the early game, but can you really see it being strong enough to protect us from the eyeball boss's Agni Yastra? Yeah, no. Nah. After whacking the tutorial enemies and getting past the tutorial boss using all of our healing items, we dive into the TV for the first challenge of saving Chie. It's worth noting that during this section there is no option to save the game until after beating Shadow Chie, so the stakes are high. A single death here means having to restart the entire dungeon, potentially losing hours of progress. Oh, and before anyone asks, we're not going to have teammates for this run, but the game won't let you remove your scare from the party yet. So I decide to try not to heal with him and only allow him to use basic attacks. I considered only allowing him to guard, but that would stop enemies from gaining extra turns by knocking him down, so I think having him use normal attacks makes things hardest for us. He's also not allowed to use his healing move outside of battle. It seems like this is the fairest we can make it without actually modding the game, what do you think? That is, if I remember to turn his direct commands on instead of act freely. Yosuke ruins the run by using his persona, but we die and go back to the main menu anyway. Right, okay, let's start again. On our second attempt, I remember to put Yosuke's direct commands on so we can force him to use basic attacks only, but we die in the first battle anyway. Six attempts later, and yes, we were booted back to the title screen after each one of those, we finally have this first battle. Auto basic attacks take out two tongue enemies and we are rewarded with our beloved Slime. Welcome to the team, friend. Slime is incredibly weak, so we need to get him leveled up and ready for action. After some close battles, it's clear that the best strategy here is just to avoid enemies and keep resetting the floor by going up and down the staircase. This way we can collect as many healing items as possible before engaging in any combat. The strategy pays off. We use vanish balls to get away from big scary mobs and only take fights we know we can win. Soon we hit the jackpot with a Zeo skill card, finally giving our slime access to an element which allows us to hit knockdowns for extra turns. We can even set up all out attacks now, leading to guaranteed shuffle times, although admittedly we were forced to take the heal cup almost every time. This also heals Yosuke, but what can you do? After hours of grinding, we're at level 10, with Slime at level 7. He now knows resist physical and has decent strength and endurance, so we should be just about ready to take on Shadow Chie. I'm going to be honest and say I was really nervous going into this fight, just because I knew that a single death would mean having to start from scratch due to the lack of any save points here. My fears soon dissipated though, as it quickly became very obvious that Shadow Chie was posing absolutely no threat to us. Our double resistance to physical moves meant that all only her Mazio and Mabufu moves were doing any significant damage, and since she does not have any fire moves, she can never hit our weakness. We just keep using auto basic attacks, and Yosuke thankfully dodges her Mazio, and she's down in just a couple of minutes. Yeah, we were probably a bit over leveled for that fight. Back in the real world, we stock up on medicines and items that can restore SP, such as tap sodas and tiny tomatoes. Yes, I'm British, so I say tomato, fight me. I'm sure you'll live, unlike me if we don't get slimes and better moves. 
During Yukiko's palace, we need to be on the lookout for two skill cards in particular, Bufu and Dodge Fire, both of which greatly help out against the upcoming Shadow Yukiko boss, who's bound to exploit our fire weakness for extra turns and massive damage. Again, the game won't let us remove party members yet, so we're forced to keep Yosuke and Chia on basic attacks. I haven't equipped them with any armor or accessories or anything, so they're just going to be cannon fodder anyway. If they die, we'll leave them down. Within a few battles, we grab a Bufu skill card and teach it to slime, making the battle so much easier because we can now hit the weakness of almost all enemies in this dungeon. We've healed up and it's time for the first challenge of the run, this dungeon's mid-boss as I like to call them, Avenger Knight. This guy's only weak to fire, which we don't have access to yet, and can dish out some seriously strong physical attacks. Yosuke falls as the boss hits half health with Chie close behind. The battle is now a 1v1 between this guy and our slime, but we're poisoned and our health is draining fast. A death here would mean losing so much progress. We try staying healthy by using the medicines we bought from the Shiroku shop earlier, but Avenger Knight hits us down with a critical skewer. Instead of finishing us off though, he fails to land an insta-kill Mudo, which means we're back up and healing ourselves. We play aggressively here despite the knight powering up. I think this is a bit greedy from me because we could have been one shot killed here, but the knight misses his next skewer and so we quickly finish him off. That was quite a fun and tense fight. We played it really badly, but luck was definitely on our side. After some grinding, we're at the boss door for Shadow Yukiko. Slime is level 15 with weak moves, but Red Wall and Bufu should be helpful. We're level 20 and we make sure not to heal our two allies in order to ensure they have the least possible impact on the fight. During Yukiko's first passionate stare, we use Red Wall to patch up our fire weakness, but she still one-shots Chi and deals big damage to the remaining two of us. We try to keep Red Walls up as Yosuke falls next. We're going to leave those two dead on the floor and not revive them, just so we're keeping more strictly to the slime only theme here. Whenever Yukiko's Ice Wall falls, we use a Bufu to knock her down and then use the extra gain turn to heal up. We keep guarding, but after a basic attack, she knocks us down with Aggie, attacks us to make us dizzy so we skip our next turn, then finishes us off with a double fang. Yeah, we definitely need to be a higher level. During the subsequent grind, we pick up an Aggie skill card. It won't be useful against Shadow Yukiko, but it will help us with grinding because it allows us to knock down more opponents for extra turns on all our attacks. For our second attempt at Yukiko, we're level 24 and Slime is 19. I've rearranged his skills around to make it easier to understand what he has access to. I'm looking forward to getting rid of Evil Touch and Fear Boost because they're basically useless, but that won't happen until the next dungeon. This attempt goes much better as we ditch the red walls in favour of just guarding. Another good tip is to guard when she's charging up Burnt to Ashes of course, but also guarding the turn after she uses Burnt to Ashes, because she'll often go for a cheeky Aggie during that turn. Her Prince comes out but isn't doing much and we just keep knocking him down with Zeo, but we get greedy and go for a basic attack. Yukiko responds with a series of fire moves and takes us down to zero from almost full health. Oh, we're so close. We grind some more and it's clear that Chie is far from happy about the situation. <laughs> Chie chants really pissed off. I'm quite happy though because we go down a few floors and start chaining together sweet bonuses from shuffle times in order to grab some great stuff, including lots of healing cups, a few skill cards, staff bonuses and level ups for slime, as well as a few extra personas that will be helpful for fusing the ones we need for social links. Finally, at level 28, we're back for another attempt. Slime is now level 23. Chie is down almost instantly and Yosuke isn't far behind. We cannot afford to get greedy here. If we just stick to the reliable pattern, then we can pull this off. We do the same as before, Bufu when her ice wall is down and use those extra turns to heal up if needed. We guard for her burn to ashes plus the turn after. We play more defensively when her prince comes out until he decides to flee. Okay, this is where Yukiko becomes much less predictable. We spend the majority of the phase guarding or going for a Bufu attack combo whenever her her ice wall falls because we know she's guaranteed to put the wall back up instead of attacking us during the next turn so we're never left vulnerable. We use a bead to fully restore our HP and she uses this as an opportunity to hit us with a critical double fang but doesn't follow up with anything instead just using a white wall. She actually had a good chance to take us out there but she threw it away. After filling all her terror voices due to us guarding 
She throws us a curveball by using Burn to Ashes out of the blue very late in the fight, but thankfully we evade the attack and a few turns later we take her out. That went surprisingly well, but admittedly we're now very over leveled. At the Shiroku pub, we trade a ladybug for a fish hook ready for the fishing later in the game. I've never understood the purpose of the stuff being sold here at night time. It's all very mediocre equipment, yet it requires a lot of rare gems to buy any of it. Personally, I just find selling the dungeon loot unlocks much better options at the blacksmiths. Plus, some of the side quests give much better weapons too, like Yosuke's corn on the cob or Kanji's fish. I don't know, have any of you guys ever bought or used anything from the nighttime pub? I'd appreciate any comments down below because something something algorithm and more people get to watch the video, whatever, cheers. Feel free to type something now while we chow down on these noodles, nom nom nom. Anyway, the fox joins our team, which means we can now heal SP while inside the TV. This will be a huge help once Slime learns a healing move. We also buy better equipment for Flub and stock up on about 100 grand's worth of healing items from the Shiroku store. Once inside, we're finally allowed to remove all party members, so the pressure really is on. As you can see from this very first fight, the odds are pretty much stacked against us. Almost every fight is brutally close, thank god for our resistance to physical or we'd be dead meat. We managed to start chaining together sweet bonuses for extra cards again, including a Dia skill card. This is absolutely huge because it allows us to actually heal in and out of battle without needing to use items. After finding some better armour and having a few more close fights, we teach Dia to slime and restore SP of the fox. The midpoint of Kenji's bathhouse is, as always, a complete joke. For those who don't know, he repeats a four move cycle which involves powering up three times and then using a single physical move. Rinse and repeat. But the funny part is that because he has such low SP, he can only use the powering up moves for a few rounds. Afterwards, he just wastes three quarters of his turn doing absolutely nothing. No way should we be able to beat him this easily when playing solo on the hardest difficulty with a freaking slime. Anyway, before heading into my kanji, we explore back in Yukiko's castle to grab some more items and try the optional boss at the top. Since he only uses physical attacks, I thought we'd have a good time, but nope, his rampage absolutely destroys us. Twice. Let's just go fight Kanji. We're level 34 for the Kanji fight and here is our equipment. I'm really happy that we have a Volt Suppressor to increase our evasion to electricity because Kanji has some really strong electric attacks. Slime is level 28 with no notable changes to his moveset. My usual apologies for the speed of the footage here, bosses in Persona challenges often last around half an hour and I'm trying to condense this down into just a minute or two for you all. We try to focus on Kanji's allies first, thankfully tough guy on the right is weak to fire and nice guy on the left is weak to ice. And for some reason when nice guy gets back up he wastes his turn helping tough guy stand up even though he was going to stand up anyway. Yeah I never understood that. We're mostly taking next to zero damage during this phase, so I'm feeling pretty confident and we start attacking Kanji himself. Despite there being no girls on the team, Kanji still uses Raw of Wrath, a move that inflicts rage on female party members. His Forbidden Murmur does a lot of poison damage to us though, so we have to keep curing those or just hard healing through them. As we get him down to low health, we're out of medicines and beads, and soon we're out of life stones. So our only healing option is Deer for about 63 life per use, which is barely anything. On top of that, Kanji starts draining all of our SP towards the end of the fight, so we're totally out of healing options. It's either he dies, or we die. We start using items such as pinwheels on him to deal decent damage without the SP requirements, and luckily he soon goes down. I really enjoyed that fight, I like how the difficulty ramped up as the fight went on. I'm still pleasantly surprised how easy it was this time around too. We continue levelling up social links despite most of them being useless in this run anyway, but hey, what else are we going to do with our time? After some gardening, reading about how to be gentle, drinking mouldy milk and being body blocked along a corridor, it's time for Dungeon 3. By the way, we could fuse a special Kaiwan with a game breaking ability called Victory Cry here on this day and pass that over to a new slime via fusion, but the community considers this to be an exploit so we're not doing it. Anyway, the blacksmith doesn't have anything better for us, we decide not to buy his latest sword since the lower accuracy could be a problem. Instead, we spend all of our hard earned cash at the Shiroku store and head on into the TV. We very quickly pick up skill cards for Garu, Mazio and Magaru and teach the latter two to slime. 
We try fighting the optional boss at the top of Yukiko's castle again, but we're still getting destroyed. Instead, we go fight the optional boss at the top of Kanji's bathhouse, and it's surprisingly easy. The intolerant officer mainly just spams Bufula and has a weakness to electricity, which we can easily exploit. The battle takes around half an hour, and we use up most of our healing items, but it's worth it for the courage boost. I think. Maybe. In Reese's dungeon, we keep grabbing the staff bonus cards as much as possible since these will offer a permanent bonus to slime, and we might need max stats in order to have a chance of beating this run. We then break wind, and it's time for this dungeon's mini boss. As always, it's an easy sweep due to its fire weakness and obsession with virus wave. Soon the game decides to kick us in the teeth though, as our healing skill Dia gets upgraded to Media. Yeah, right, that's not an upgrade. Since we're playing solo, it just has the same effect with a higher SP cost. Oh well, time to fight Risa and Teddy. We're level 51 and Slime is in the low 40s, and the Shadow Risa fight goes pretty well. She does her usual rotation of elemental attacks from 4 fire moves to 4 ice moves, 4 electric and then 4 wind. We're forced to use up some of our healing items, but we're never in any serious danger. She throws some physical attacks into the mix, but after falling below half health, she does her little invincibility scan thing, and then the fight automatically ends after 3 turns. We push onto the Shadow Teddy fight. Shadow Teddy is known for being an absolute tank, so I already knew that this would be a long fight. Look, this fight took almost an hour, so I apologise for the sped up footage with parts cut out. The strategy is to guard whenever he uses mind charge or lowers our defense, as these moves are always guaranteed to be followed up with something strong. Physical moves work well, but magic mirrors are a very bad idea, as he will absorb his own damage to massively heal himself, as I found out firsthand. His foolish whispers just silence us, so they're basically him wasting turns, especially when the skill misses, so we essentially gain an extra turn to heal or deal some damage. We try to use items to inflict damage, because our regular attack and basic magic skills are only dealing around 40 damage at best, whereas the items are hitting for 50. As the battle drags on though, we're soon out of healing items and relying exclusively on media to keep us alive, which is only healing for around 63 per use. We can stabilise ourselves, but that leaves almost no opportunities to attack, and our SP reserves are quickly depleting. We get Shadow Teddy down to about a fifth of his health, but we've used up all of our SP restoring items, so it's just a matter of time until we simply cannot heal anymore. I decide to have one final aggressive push, but we're slammed down with a couple of basic attacks. It's back to the title screen for us, meaning the progress we made by defeating Risa has also been lost. This is a huge setback, and I don't want to waste this much time again, so I decide we need to spend some serious time grinding. We farm enemies mainly on the lower floors of the dungeon to avoid getting destroyed by the dangerous enemies higher up, like those tanks that can one-shot you by charging up a Bufu die. I can't remember how long the farming took, but it was more than a few trips to the box for SP restoration. We do manage to pick up a Garula skill card though, which is our first medium power magic skill, as well as a wind boost to accompany it. Here's our setup going in a second time. Slime is level 51 with much better endurance, its moves are a bit convoluted at the moment, but I'm hoping we'll get more upgrades in the next palace, if we can get past Shadow Teddy. We are level 60, and we have an ice suppressor accessory equipped to give us a good chance at evading the constant ice attacks that Teddy dishes out. Obviously the resale boss is much easier this time around, and we barely need to use any items. That means we have more healing items ready for Shadow Teddy. The difference this time around is immediately obvious. We're taking less damage, healing ourselves about 10% more with Media, and we're not having to rely on items. In fact, throughout this entire fight, the only items we use are SP restoring items like Snuff Souls. Garula is hitting for around 90 per hit, more than double what our skills were inflicting last time. However, we're careful to only attack when our health is over 300, just in case. Needless to say, 24 minutes later, Shadow Teddy collapses in defeat. Job done. The only problem is that we're only 3 dungeons in and we've already had to grind to level 60, so I'm guessing we're going to have to hit the level cap by about the 5th dungeon. Then I don't know what we're going to be able to do except get slime stats up with shuffle time cards. 
For now though, let's just enjoy our victory. We fire up the scooter to explore Okina City and watch Teddy on a massage chair. Um, okay. We tried to prioritize ranking up Risa from this point onwards since her support skills are going to be vital going forward, including her buff skills and her ability to bring us back from the dead once per battle. Yeah, I don't see Futaba being able to revive the dead. I'm just kidding. Let's not open that can of worms or there'll be a flame war in the comments section. We casually ace our exams and head into Mitsuo's dungeon, Void Quest. Our first battle inside grants us an amazing prize as a skill up card upgrades resist physical to null physical, meaning we are now immune to all physical attacks. This is genuinely game changing and makes farming so much easier since about half of all enemies are unable to inflict any damage on us now. We go back and easily defeat the Yukiko optional boss since he can no longer hit us at all, grab an Agilao skill card to upgrade Aggie and just keep farming enemies. Yosuke is wanting to assist us with a cavalry attack where allies who are not in your party speed in on a bike to help out, but we decline because it's not really in the spirit of a solo run. We get torrent shot from another skill up, easily take down an annoying tank enemy using a magic mirror so it one shots itself, watch dice self destruct to kill two golden hands for me, thanks dice, and make it to the mid boss of the dungeon, killing hand. Now let me explain the problem here, killing hand will continue to spawn in almighty hands which are the white ones. And those white hands constantly heal the killing hand with diorama. Diorama? Diorama? Whatever. Therefore, we can't defeat the killing hand due to the huge healing it's receiving. We just don't have enough damage output. And if we kill the almighty hand, then another one just gets summoned in straight after. It's quite a predicament. Eventually we find the solution, we decide to let the almighty hand run out of SP while we leave it on auto attack, which takes a very long time, then we kill the killing hand. Almighty hand runs away and that's the win. It's obvious that the upcoming Shadow Mitsuo boss is going to be challenging, heck he's even challenging for a full party of 4 on this difficulty, let alone a solo run using one weak persona, so we just keep grinding for now. Claw 9 in particular is good since we gain loads of XP here while the majority of enemies can't inflict any damage on us. Anytime we encounter a tough mob we just escape or use a vanish ball. We even upgrade Garula to Magarula using another skill up. Here's our setup going into Shadow Mitsuo. We're a whopping level 71 with Risei at 63. Slime is chilling down at level 60, but he's got some decent moves now. Our primary sources of damage will be Magarula since it's receiving a 25% wind boost bonus, as well as a few Magatama items we have in our inventory, which each deal 150 damage. Our sword is strong but offers no passive bonuses. Similarly, our armor has high defense but low evasion and no passives either. We equip the paper armband from Nanako, which grants us plus 5 to all of our stats. Let's go. As a reminder, to actually damage this boss, you need to get him out of his blocky hero character form. Once he's out, you only have a very limited time to damage him before he gets back into a stronger version of the hero body, unless you manage to destroy it with excessive damage. We don't have to worry about any of that here though because Mitsuo is absolutely destroying us. His normal attacks are hitting for between 80 and 90 damage and he gets twice as many turns as we do. No physical isn't blocking the damage since his basic attacks are classed as almighty damage. We keep healing but it's leaving us with almost no opportunities to attack. To make matters worse, being inflicted with exhaustion means we're bleeding SP and have lowered defences, meaning he's capable of hitting for well over 100 per hit while we're exhausted. Needless to say, we're 10 minutes into the fight and haven't even managed to get him out of his body once yet. We're out of good healing items so we just die. It's clear that we need to do an immense amount of grinding for this one. We head back to Reese's dungeon for a change of scene, gaining Tempest Slash from a skill up card while we're here. It's debatable whether this is an upgrade over Torrent Shot, but whatever. Again, the optional boss at the top of this palace only does physical damage, so we're completely invincible. We keep farming back at Mitsuo's floor 9 for hours, managing to upgrade Wind Amp to Wind Boost for a 50% bonus instead of 25, and also get Megarion. From this point, it won't allow us to upgrade our skills any further, so unless we somehow pick up an incredible skill card, these moves are what we're stuck with until we beat this boss. We're back at level 82, Reese at 79 and Slime is at level 70. 
His magic and endurance stats are good, but his agility is still very low, meaning we won't be doing much dodging. But during the battle, we are starting to dodge the occasional attack, which buys us more time to heal up. After some strong Magarulas, he's out of his hero body. We miss the opportunity to do an automatic all-out attack here since we're alone, but at least his basic attacks are now being nullified. He's building up his second hero body while throwing various status effects at us. Sadly, our luck stat is way too low to resist these. We've mostly stabilised, but a ghastly whale one-shot kills us since we're fearful. A lot more grinding is still needed for this fight. We try to aim for stat upgrade cards from the shuffle times, sometimes we get lucky, whereas other times we're forced to make difficult choices. By this point, I've basically spent my entire day grinding for this boss, endlessly battling shadows while watching YouTube in the background. Going in for our third attempt, we're a whopping level 98, Reese is 96 and Slime is at 85 with a decent move set. but will it be enough? It's obvious from this first phase that we have improved, but only very, very slightly. We keep healing with ointments for 200 HP a shot and hitting good Magarulas. Outside his hero suit, we stay healthy and avoid most of the status afflictions, but our damage output is too low. We barely manage to take a quarter of his health off him by the time he suits up into his level 2 hero body. Shadow Mitsuo now deals much more damage with his regular attacks and also has access to the powerful spell Gigadine. His bombs keep us exhausted, but we somehow manage to get him out of his suit a second time. This time, we're not so lucky, and we die to another fear, ghastly whale, one-shot kill combo. Okay, let's get real for a moment here. Shadow Mitsuo is the 7th of 13 main story bosses in this game, so he's the middle of the difficulty curve, and yet we're almost max level with an almost maxed out persona. Grinding that little bit further won't make much of a difference in this fight. We need to think of a totally new plan. Luckily, I've got some sneaky ideas, but it involves farming for a few obscure materials from very specific enemies and heading back to the real world for now leaving Shadow Mitsuo here for another day. We sell our materials to the blacksmith, unlocking a slightly better weapon called Kagadachi, which we grab just for the 20 max HP boost, as well as the Passion Sweat armor, which offer a massive boost to our defenses and evasion, and it grants us Auto Tarakaja, boosting our attack for the first three turns of every fight. We also craft and purchase a Bravery Vessel, which significantly reduces the chance of us being inflicted with fear, which should help us to survive when Mitsuo is in baby form. Next we fuse a Kikuri Hime by combining a Takarasu with Gorgon. We also fuse a Garuda and a Hellbiker, but more on that last one later in the run. After wasting a day receiving the Okina City Cafe tutorial, we seriously stock up on ointments and take Garuda to the cafe, granting us the Garudine skill card, a much more powerful wind attack. We then do the same for Kikuri Hime, granting us the Dirahan skill card, a move which fully heals us for only 18 SP. After teaching the new skills to Slime, we're back at Mitsuo. We're at level 99, same as Rise, and Slime is at 87 with maxed out endurance, which is basically its defense. Right off the bat, we're hitting for over 300 damage, which is incredible. He's soon out of his hero body, but we only managed to take about a quarter of his real health off before he suits back up into his leveled up form. This phase lasts quite a long time since he can deal much more damage now, and his exhaustion bombs are seriously hurting our SP, which we vitally need for our strategy to work. We get him out a second time and deal decent damage, but we're killed off by a fear ghastly whale combo again. Oh, well, it was only after the fight that I realised I'd forgotten to equip the accessory that reduces the chance of fear. Um, whoops. Nonetheless, we still need more damage output. Remember, this boss is balanced around the assumption that four characters will be attacking him. We're so close! It's back to farming for another afternoon. These platinum dice respawn almost infinitely, so are a great source of XP. And we soon grab a Resist Fire card. Bingo! This covers our only weakness and will be crucial for the future of this run. Back at Mitsuo, we're still max level obviously, and this time we've remembered to actually equip the Bravery Vessel. Slime is sitting at level 93 and now has both Wind Boost and Wind Amp, and yes they do stack in this game. With even better stats we go in to beat this guy once and for all. 
phase one and we're hitting for well over 400 damage holy jesus he's out of his body in just a few turns now he's using some bad electric moves which are barely hurting us and his evil touch fear moves just aren't affecting us anymore remember how we barely took a quarter of his health off him here last time well this time we get him below half health so he rapidly gets his hero suit back on this second phase takes quite a long time since we have to keep dealing with his exhaustion bombs so we're not totally starved of sp still he's soon out of his hero body a second time and we are continuing to hit hard again his attacks are basically doing nothing but after we get him to around 10 percent hp he suits up a third time oh god what is this guy <laughs> he just refuses to go down Phase 3 is tough because he's locking our SP at zero with exhaustion and we really shouldn't fight his baby form until we have enough SP for at least a few Garadines. Eventually we manage to restore a bit of SP without it being drained from exhaustion, hit him out of his hero body again and since he has a green wall up we finish him off with a frost magatama. But what? He's not dead? His health bar was at zero and he fell out of his suit. Oh whatever, one more Garadine secures our victory. Job done. My heart is absolutely racing and overcoming that brutal challenge. Now we just have to skip a boatload of pointless dialogue as we plead for a save point. I know I don't talk about the daily life side of the games much in these challenge runs because there's not a lot to say and it would make the videos way too long, but all of these cafe visits plus needing a second full day inside the TV really hurt our schedule. So we're several days behind with various social links such as the fox. We'll need a few different social links maxed out later in the game so we can get some amazing skill cards at the cafe. For now, let's just celebrate our incredible victory over Mitsuo with these fireworks. Yeah! Back into the TV and the optional boss at the top of Mitsuo's dungeon can't even hit us so that's another free courage boost. And soon we're in Naoto's dungeon, the secret lab. We're insanely over leveled so the enemies here are just a joke, including the mini boss who also can't even hit us. He blows himself up for a cheeky 57 damage at the end and we go on to fight Shadow Naoto herself. Nothing much to say here, Slime is still level 94 because we haven't really spent any time grinding in this dungeon, we just kind of skimmed through it. Shadow Naoto has mostly mediocre skills, with her only decent move being Galgalim Eyes, which lowers the target's HP to 1 and inflicts enervation. Our first attempt goes really well until we get hit with the Galgalim Eyes, fail to be able to summon our persona, then die to a mute rate. Okay, that was just unlucky. Second try, things are looking much better. Risei keeps buffing us, so Naoto waits turns, dispelling the buffs with the Takadja, and we just use items to moderately heal up every time we're hit with a Galgalim. After only 7 minutes, Naoto falls. Overall, this dungeon only took us about half an hour. That was a really quick one. We spend a touching moment with Marie, max out Risei's social link so she can block lethal attacks, grab an invigorate skill card from the cafe for SP regeneration in case we need it for longer fights, get the best bug timing ever, yes the trick is to press it as soon as the net passes the top of the end fence post, and become extremely uncomfortable at Teddy's animations again. Um, Teddy? The Juness concert is an absolute highlight of the game for me, especially considering the song was dubbed in English by Laura Bailey. We quickly max out Namco's social link before she gets kidnapped, admire the quality of a certain teacher's face, and get paid 50,000 yen for doing well in our exam. Jesus Dejima, how much do you actually earn to be able to splash out like that on a whim? After grabbing some great XP boost armor from a side quest, we're back inside the TV. We start by heading back through the lab and beating the optional boss there, who falls incredibly quickly due to its wind weakness and lack of any serious damage output. We push on through Nanako's dungeon, heaven. This is definitely my favourite dungeon, nice wide open passageways, bright lighting, amazing music, and doors that don't take half an hour to open, unlike some. The mini boss here falls in less than 2 minutes from our strong wind attacks, and we move on to the final floor. Here's our setup with slime now level 98 thanks to the 50% XP boost from the new armour. 
Kuni no Sagiri isn't too scary during solo runs as he has no party members to take control of. Instead, he just spams seemingly random elemental magic attacks. None of these are particularly threatening until he starts using quad convergence to change the atmosphere, boosting the power of a single element at a time. But we just heal through it with Dirahan. Our SP does dip below 100 a couple of times in the fight, but Reese is contributing a lot of help, so we're never in any real danger. After only 10 minutes, he falls. I think all the excessive grinding we did in Mitsuo's dungeon earlier has definitely paid off with those last two dungeons. We continue to max out social links so we have the ability to craft ultimate personas just in case we want to obtain skill cards from any of them at the cafe. We grab the partial award from Nanako's cushion, traverse some nasty frame rate fog, fuse a hell biker to cash in at the cafe for an absorb fire skill card and repeat the process by fusing a Horus and using it to grab absorb wind. These are strict upgrades over passive skills that slime already has into the killer's dungeon and the vast majority of the enemies here can't even damage us now due to us being invulnerable to three different types of damage and our high agility allowing us to dodge other attacks regularly. The killer's dungeon has two mini bosses. This first one is super easy since the enemies can only do regular attacks and summon, that's it. Providing you kill them all on exactly the same turn, it's a walk in the park. We're dealing some massive damage on enemies here now, yeah! The second mini boss is more of a challenge however as it loves inflicting panic and spamming Megadalaon, an extremely powerful almighty attack for which there are no defences in this game. We just play it slow and Rise helps out a lot. The trick is to only attack when we're at full HP, normally after it misses an attack. It took 11 minutes but it finally fell. For the sake of completion we also go back and fight the optional boss at the top of Nanako's dungeon who is an absolute joke because it keeps using attacks that we're invincible to even though it has access to the ice move Brufudine. Top notch AI right there. It falls after only a couple of minutes. A fair warning to look away from your screen now for about a minute if you don't know who the killer is in Persona 4. As always, I won't say the killer's name out loud, so if you have any intention of ever finishing this game, please look away until I say it's safe because it's a massive spoiler. Here we go. Slime is level 99 now, obviously, and here are the killer stats with a wide variety of moves. Spoiler time. The killer starts with a heat riser, which we immediately purify. Most of that person's attacks don't affect us very much. You can tell I'm deliberately not even revealing the gender of the killer for anyone who's currently listening but looking away from the screen. We do get hit by an evil smile ghastly whale combo, which is giving me horrifying Mitsuo flashbacks. But luckily, Reese blocks it. The second time an eggplant takes the hit, they basically act as a homunculus in this game so it's worth growing a few in the Dejima's garden for exactly this kind of situation. Other than that, I'm pleased to say the fight was pretty easy as we repeatedly just spammed Garadine. We do get hit with another fear status ailment but we don't miss our turn this time so we just cure it and finish off our opponent. Ok, the killer is now off screen so it's safe to come back, though I'd still consider the rest of the game a spoiler but whatever, it's your life. Amano Sagiri, aka that eyeball boss that no one understands the relevance of, is a seriously formidable opponent. It's got a move list longer than the wait for a western release of Persona 5 Scramble, or a switch port of Persona 5 Royal am I right? <laughs> and it's seriously tanky. God's Judgment is the move we should be most scared of here since it deletes half of our max HP rounded up and remember that the eyeball receives two turns for every one of ours just like Mitsuo did. As this 32 minute fight played out my only comfort was remembering that Rise can revive us from the dead once per battle and also block a lethal attack once per battle thanks to her social link. That means we can afford to slip up twice and not die. Luckily we didn't need her revive though, just lots and lots of healing items. The eyeball is keen to throw some fire and wind moves our way for us to absorb into healing, thank you very much, and repeatedly attack us with physical attacks that do absolutely nothing. The strategy is to be super patient, just keep healing up and only ever attack if you're over 500 HP, basically any time the eyeball wastes its turn. Finally, it falls down. What a fight. That was super fun and definitely one of the reasons I do these challenge runs. No XP or cash rewards from this fight though, for some reason. Feels bad, man.
We celebrate by checking on our crops since Nanako thinks they might catch a cold. <laughs> Good job we can harvest them in minus three days. Okay, I'll add that one to the glitch list. Anyway, we get Reese's third awakening for her complete analysis skill, fuse a Lilith and take it to the cafe for a Makarakan skill card, that's the move which creates a magic reflection barrier, and we spend an extra day in the TV just to farm some quest items and stat upgrade cards. While there, we try fighting the Reaper. For anyone who doesn't know, this guy's an optional super boss that can randomly appear if you open too many treasure chests. His Mega Delawons hit really hard for over 200 damage each, and we quickly use up Reese's one-time block. The strategy here is to respect him, respect his damage output, and only attack when there's an opportunity, normally when you have well over 500 HP. Towards the middle of the fight, the Reaper wastes lots of turns on light and dark insta-kill moves that just don't connect, as well as a variety of physical attacks like myriad arrows that we're obviously immune to. Yeah, this guy's AI is absolutely terrible. Literally the only thing he does well is spam Mega Delaon. Anyway, we keep hitting Garadines and using items to fully restore our HP and SP when necessary. With his dying breath, he uses a mind charge only to absolutely destroy us with a powered up mind charge. Yeah, just kidding, he's stupid, he died. We're awarded with arguably the best sword in the game, Blade of Totsuka, but we're not going to equip it. Why? Well, we're not going to be hitting bosses with physical attacks since Garadine is double boosted, so we don't need any extra physical damage. Funnily enough, the 20 HP bonus from our current mediocre sword is much more useful to us. Back in the real world, we exchange a boatload of gold chains for almost a grand with a random teacher in the middle of a school corridor and start fusing personas for Margaret's social link. This is an expensive process and leaves us needing to literally wash dishes to raise funds because we're totally broke. No one said Persona Challenge running was a glamorous job, sometimes you just gotta get your hands dirty. After fusing the final Persona, Trumpeter, we max out Margaret's social link and cash it in at the cafe for a debilitate skill card. We probably won't use it, but it's nice to have. We're definitely not giving this skill card to Marie though, since it costs 200,000 yen to buy back. Anyway, we continue on having almost zero money. Look, we don't even have enough money for Tanaka. I'm sorry Tanaka, your commodities are still amazing though. We go skiing and prepare for Marie's dungeon. This is the new optional dungeon introduced with the golden version of the game. I remember that the gimmick here is that you do not get to bring any of your weapons, armor, accessories, items or costumes into this dungeon for some reason. Instead, you must rely on whatever you can scrounge off of the enemies and from chests, so grinding is very important. Oh, and you also lose 50% of your SP after every fight, though you can pick up accessories that restore a small amount of it each turn in battle. All clear? Great. We're mainly on the lookout for Windbreakers, <laughs> which will need to be able to use Garadine against the upcoming boss, and of course more stat upgrade cards. But let's just take a minute to talk about this annoying chap. Gorgeous King. This guy is the absolute bane of solo runs. Let me explain why. Firstly, he boasts high defenses and can infinite spawn in allies every time you kill them. Okay, not ideal, but not too bad, right? Wrong. Hitting this guy's physical weakness only damages him for about 3 damage. And he has 4,000 health. What's worse is that this guy isn't interested in killing you, oh no, he doesn't even damage you at all, he just wants to troll you with constant status ailments. Evil touch for fear, maca jams for silence, and sometimes rage or poison, the list goes on. The guy is just memeing, and I wouldn't be surprised if he started teabagging us. He can even drain your SP just to annoy you even more. I literally stopped the recording and left it on auto attack while I went to cook dinner and eat it. After 40 minutes he's finally out of SP. He doesn't even have enough SP to drain our SP. We finish him off, followed closely by his final buddy, Jesus Christ, solo runners, beware of this guy. You won't die to him, he'll just make you rage, and not just with his Balzac skill. 
The second mini boss here is more difficult, but more interesting. At least this one is making an actual effort to win the battle. Heaven's Giant has some strong moves and nullifies everything except physical and almighty damage, so we just keep using basic attacks on it. It's only a 6 minute fight and then it's down. You have to really like combat to enjoy this extra dungeon by the way. The doors can spawn in extra enemies and even locked treasure chests can spawn extra enemies. It feels like they were deliberately padding out the dungeon so they could be like, ooh there's 5 hours of extra content in this golden edition of the game or something, I don't know. I still love the dungeon though, the atmosphere and the music are particularly brilliant. Onto the boss and here are our stats. Ignore strength since that's for physical damage so we don't need that. Our agility is still a bit low but everything else is good. Meanwhile here are the boss's stats. Nothing too amazing except her ability to reflect everything in her god form Kasumi no Akami. Marie does good mega allow on damage but nothing too fancy and she also misses a lot of her turns from being sad. Aww. She's down after just a couple of minutes. Time for the main course though as Marie has a full on meltdown. We start with a firebreaker to throw some flame Datakus at her for 150 damage each, but we quickly move to a windbreaker so we can hit her with our fabulously double boosted Garadines for around 700 damage a hit. Since she only has 8000 health this is obviously not going to take very long. The key is just to be careful of when her defences return to normal since the breakers only last for 3 turns. She becomes more aggressive as the fight continues, inflicting dizzy to make us skip turns but we're never in any serious danger. Towards the end of the fight she starts screaming to nullify stat decreases which don't exist. We haven't decreased her stats at all. I don't know if this is just bad AI again or if the game is deliberately doing this to give us free extra turns or if it's meant to represent Marie's inner conflict with herself. Don't know, don't care. It buys us enough time to throw more flame Takus at her for the win. No XP or money reward again here, in fact you can't gain any money in this entire dungeon. The only reason to complete this optional dungeon at all is for the extra epilogue at the end of the game which is cool I suppose. We receive a much better reward though. Nanako admires our slime only challenge run so much that she creates a slime jelly for us to eat. Oh, thanks Nanako. Let's tuck in. Oh, 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 wait, it's, oh, oh, we've passed out. In order to access the final dungeon of the game and the final boss, you must select no when prompted to go home after speaking to all your friends. It's a shame that so many people miss this, it's kind of hidden after all. We're back at the Juness food court and after finding out about the super mastermind behind the entire game, who again I won't name for spoiler reasons, we're in Ashihara Nakatsu. Oh no, now it's called Yomotsu Hirosake. Yeah, someone help me out here. Enemies here are nothing special, they just have more resistances than in the other dungeons. Remember, there is now no more time for cafe trips or ranking up social links. We must complete this dungeon on this day or we fail the run. The stakes are high. The first of two mini bosses here is super easy and dies in half a dozen Garadines. We soon find a Sonidori wear armor which has great stats and grants us an extra 100 max SP. Nice. Next we meet the wackiest looking shadow ever. Like what is this supposed to even represent? Shadows are supposed to be the hidden, suppressed, true selves of people, right? Did one guy secretly want to be a party alien UFO? <laughs> Moving on. The second mini boss puts up more of a fight with its powerful spells and higher defences but it stupidly keeps healing us with fire moves when we absorb fire so it's down in a few minutes. Job done. We're 42 hours into the run and it's time for the final boss. It's an army is no joke, especially on the hardest difficulty and especially solo, let alone with a freaking slime. If you can't be bothered to read all this info, the short version is that phase 1 equals easy mode, phase 2 equals death. Got it? Great. Our equipment is the same except for equipping the bead ring from Nanako to give us a bit more evasion from magic attacks, or and slime is about the same as it was before. Let's go. Phase 1 and we're getting some decent damage in while dodging a few of her attacks. She's quick to silence us and hit us with Mega Delaons, but the strategy here was the same as with the Reaper. Absolutely respect her and her potential damage output. Don't get greedy. 
We always fully heal up, even if we're only missing a couple of hundred health, unless we're absolutely sure she cannot kill us in the next turn. It's a slow strategy that requires patience, but we have plenty of items to drag out the fight, so it's very effective. After six minutes, we pull out Igor's shiny orb, and she's onto her second phase. Her attacks here are now much more relentless, and she can also drain electric damage, including her own electric moves if they're reflected back at her. Again, we're slow and respectful trying not to take any risks. Sometimes we go five, six, seven, or even eight turns in a row without inflicting any damage, just waiting for a chance to safely strike. It's worth keeping a Makarakan wall up at all times to protect against her demonic judgment, a move which inflicts damage equal to 50% of your max HP, which hurts like hell. Another one to watch out for is the Galgalim Eyes, which reduces you to one HP and inflicts innovation, though I'm pretty sure she only uses this one time immediately after you get her below half health. Her true killer though is summons to Yomi. This move instantly kills you with 100% accuracy if you are inflicted with a state assailment, otherwise it does nothing. Sadly, despite her being super low, she uses World's End to inflict exhaustion and then finishes us off with summons to Yomi. Oh, that was so close. Also, the wiki says World's End inflicts innovation, not exhaustion. Yeah, someone should really fix that. After farming some more staff bonuses, we're back. This time we've equipped the healthy recipe accessory to increase our resistance to exhaustion. We'll fast forward through phase one since it was basically the same thing and not too difficult. The only difference this time is that we're not dodging as much since we no longer have the accessory from Nanako equipped. This means that there are even fewer opportunities to attack. In phase two we get super unlucky as she reflects electricity back at herself twice for lots of healing. Ugh. By the way, you'll probably notice that our Garudine and Diarahan skills have been quote upgraded to Magarudine and Meteorahan. Yeah, that happened while farming shuffle times and I forgot about the skill cards to change them back. Oh well, they do the same thing, just at a higher SP cost and SP isn't really a problem for us anymore. We try to use diamond shields to boost our defences occasionally, which seriously reduces incoming damage for three turns and luckily we don't get exhausted from any of her world's ends. As soon as she uses Thousand Curses, I breathe a sigh of relief, we get sucked into the floor, encouraged by our social links, become invincible to the attacks of a literal god, and launch myriad troops to complete the run. Can you be Persona 4 Golden with only a single slime battling alone on the hardest difficulty? Hell yeah you can. That was a really fun challenge. MVP definitely goes to no physical. While we celebrate by watching the ending cutscenes, I'd love to hear some of your ideas for future challenge runs. Just drop me a comment down below or message on Discord. I want to grow this channel to get more people interested in the Persona series and RPGs in general. Coming up, well, we haven't done any Persona 5 Strikers yet and that game is amazing so I'm keen to try a challenge run for that one soon, but we also haven't done any for Persona 3 yet and oh my god there's so many runs I want to try. GG guys, see you in the next one. Cheers. Next we fuse a cute. Next, we fuse a Kikuri Hime by, confirm by combining Yatagarat. Oh my god. <laughs> next, next, <laughs> next, we fuse a Kikuri Hime by com combining Yatagarat. Oh my good god, how do you even say that? Next, we fuse a Kikuri Hime by combining Yatagarasu. Yatagarat. <laughs> Next, we fuse a Kikuri Hime by combining Yatagara. Oh, there, there. Calculus in this game, so it's worth growing a few in the garden. So it's worth. Oh, I'm gonna sneeze. Oh, I'm gonna sneeze. I can't sneeze. <coughs> oh my god, there's so many runs I wanna try. Let. Now my phone's ringing. Hey, Senpai. Why don't you like and subscribe so you can see more Persona Challenge runs? We'd love to see you again.